matters of housekeeping for the course. Uh, as, as many of you, I think, saw the first paper assignment's been posted. It's online. Uh, you have all the details there. It turns out the article we refer, you, we refer you to is so popular that it was very quickly put behind a paywall. Uh, but we now have the PDF uh, available on iSight, so you should be able to uh, obtain that there. Um, we're asking you to respond to a piece that Francis Fukuyama wrote. It touches on a lot of the themes of the course uh, for the first, from the first eight weeks. And it's due March 4th, I believe. Is that right? Yes. Related to the next two weeks coming up, um, I'm going to post two extracurricular office hours. Uh, I believe it's going to be uh, the next two Tuesdays at Kirkland House. Uh, if you want to do office hours there, I'm going to be eating dinner there at 6. So you're welcome to stop by if you need uh, any feedback on papers, blog posts, where the course is going. Also, we're going to ask you for next week to answer a short little survey that's going to help us think about psychological biases. So you'll receive that at some point, uh, probably Tuesday. Um, it's going to be very quick, but please, please answer it because it's going to help us a lot on Thursday when we think about um, how we perceive different things uh, and how that might be incorporated in institutional design. <clears throat> Today is very much a transition day. Uh, we're, we, this is our last chance to fill our conceptual toolbox. The course is about to take a big shift. We're going to talk about psychological biases uh, and some of the implicit problems that those create for institutions next week. And then we're off to the races in case studies. Uh, case studies where we try to diagnose and think through actual real world cases of institutional corruption, um, getting down to, uh, getting out of the clouds that we've been in, in the theory uh, and getting to actual practice. So today is the day we need to get clear on concept, concepts. If there's stuff that's still not clear to you, that's been uh, bouncing around your head, that you want clarification going into the second half of the course, today is the time to do it. <clears throat> Lexig has introduced this concept of corruption as some deviation from true north. Um, and this magnet can be conceptualized in a variety of different ways. Today we're going to talk about, I think, two particularly useful and enlightening conceptions. And we've already pointed out that to even talk about due north is to consider purposes. It's to consider, you know, what are the ends, a deviation from which we think is some form of corruption. Uh, so establishing purpose is really important. And then saying why something hasn't achieved a purpose is part of the analytic uh, strategy we need to pursue. And we've already talked about um, some of the characteristic kinds of corruption that can occur. One, very explicitly, you might think of conflicts of interest that conflict uh, with some other objective need for uh, you know, clear decisions. Um, you can imagine a judge that has an interest in a case who's going to make certain money if a plaintiff um, you know, gets a certain outcome in their way, and that judge would be biased. So we thought a lot about how you might re-engineer conflicts of interest to keep those uh, out of our way. However, we've also looked at how sometimes it's not so clear how to balance these, these conflicts of interest. Politics is a sort of paradigm example of that. Uh, people are conflicted, but precisely, you know, who should actually win is itself up for debate. Uh, so it's, it's harder to engineer out conflicts of interest. We want to make these conflicts productive, hopefully in some way that redounds to larger public good, uh, rational discourse, something like that. And finally, last uh, Tuesday, Lessig introduced us to um, sort of additional considerations of how law, that is the political power that everybody uh, considers the most you know, overarching power in the land, might be used to also shape these other forces that shape behavior, norms, markets, uh, physical and metaphorical architecture. And these questions, I think, are very much questions of what economists call mechanism design. So they're questions of engineering. Um, how are you going to uh, take the law and have it change market incentives, uh, the marginal prices? How are you going to have it you know, involved in campaigns and smoking? How is it physically going to be shaping our landscape? And then there's this residual question, though, which is how the law itself gets shaped. Uh, this is the Latin phrase for who guards the guardians, um, uh, an ancient question going back to, to Plato and Seneca. And uh, that's where I think the question is you know, most uncertain uh, and requires uh, a lot of political thought. And it's easy to say we want the right mix, right? We want the right mix of incentives. We want uh, norms that are helpful. We want good architecture. Um, but I think we can say more about the nature of influences we have in mind. Uh, so that's a sort of a general level, and we're going to try to take it down to one more level of determination today. So we've been working with 
this is one of at least three definitions you've gotten of institutional corruption, uh, an influence within an economy of influence. This recognizes, as Lessig's diagram sort of suggests, that there are many influences acting on that main point. Uh, there are a lot of ways uh, that influences are operating, and oftentimes uh, intention, but in legitimate tension. And it's an influence that wrongfully weakens the effectiveness of an institution, especially by weakening necessary public trust. So keep that, keep that in mind today as we go through uh, and work through some examples. And ask yourself if we can actually say something more determined about the nature of these bad influences. What we're going to suggest today is that there are two, say, overarching concepts that might be useful. Uh, they're not either or uh, conceptual apparatuses, um, and they're not exclusive conceptual apparatuses, but I think they make understandable the nature of institutional corruption a lot in a number of domains, and will give us a way to take analysis from one domain and transfer its sort of formal qualities to another. <clears throat> So let's think through a test case of improper dependence. What, what might that mean? Uh, we talked uh, in the opening class, we asked what sort of institutions can we give easy purposes to? Uh, and uh, we admitted politics was hard, but we thought some others, medicine might be easy, and someone said universities. So I'd like to know more about your idea of a university. You're at Harvard, you have a lot of up-close knowledge about higher ed institutions, and the question is what, what purpose? What purpose do universities serve? Uh, we began some of these the other day. Shout them out. What do you want? Education, education great. <laughs> research, research and education, varieties on that theme, wonderful. Um, okay, well, who does Harvard or what does Harvard depend on to actually function then? Give me a list. So alumni, endowment, okay, so that's going to be, I guess some of that goes back to, uh, who is that guy who left John Harvard the books? Nathaniel, okay, you've never seen the uh, historical tours that go around Harvard? <laughs> I used to sit outside and I got this portion of the uh, story every day. So there's some initial endowment and there's later endowment that's going to come partly from alumni. Who else does the university require for support? Who does it depend on? Who's that? Professors. Okay. So people need to be willing to be in this profession. Are they, they particularly with some of the salaries they pay in higher education? Uh, strong judicial systems and a forced path for the research institution aspect. So it's a dependency. And map that out, make that one step further. Why do they depend on patent law? Because it's the main reason, the main source of funding. So they have Idea, so say the commercialization okay. of ideas. Okay. okay. Uh. Okay. Yes, that's you. <laughs> the government also. Ah, okay, government. Okay. So, so, so you have, uh, so tax, they have tax benefits uh, as nonprofit organizations. What else does the government do? Funding, so you have research funding, so you might think NIH, NSF. What else does the government do, funding-wise? Yeah, student, various sorts of uh, student support, tuition support, uh, aids, loans, grants. Okay, who else? Student Students, yes, students are on this list. I'm, I'm glad you all included yourselves, and, and ha, you support the university in many ways. What's the biggest way you support the university? <laughs> Tuition, okay. Uh, what else belongs on this list? The trustees, yeah, so these are people that are willing to serve. Okay, so let's say public. You know, the public's paying for a lot of this stuff through all these tax benefits, these uh, research grants. Um, so they want to know what they're getting out of it. Is there a public use for this, a return for that? So you might think of, yeah, the profession, support, staff. Um, 
absolutely necessary for the university to function. Oftentimes stuff we can buy in an open market, but uh, definitely part of that. Anything else? What else? What are the dependencies of the university? Okay, so facilities, I think we'll, we'll put that as part of, you know, these are material conditions. So endowment, money, uh, facilities. Certainly, yeah, let's put, yeah, I think it's under government. There's a lot of tax structure there. There needs to be a functional economy out there uh, for, well, probably for some people to learn. Or, I mean, for one to want to learn. This is, there, there has to be some market for the kind of things you're providing here. Um, for, we might also include for these funding things, there are private foundations. Uh, and I'll add to Kip's commercial idea. So there's also very public-private public partnerships um, where they share. You know, a company will come to uh, Harvard and say, look, we're interested in exploring this new um, biological, uh, you know, biologic agent that might reduce cancer rates. Um, can we partner? We're going to provide the upfront up funding. If it suddenly works, we get a patent, and then we commercialize it later. The university makes money. Uh, this is the famous Buy Dole Act that basically made this possible um, uh, in the last 20 years. What else? There's, there's another thing that a lot of universities depend on, maybe less than Harvard does. Reputation. Reputation. Okay, say more about that. How do you get your reputation? Um, I was also discussing um, in straight terms of awards and recognition, um, which I guess can be very important, but you know, it's also the nature of our reputation. Okay. What are most people most proud of when they think of their college? Rankings. Rankings. So, oh, sports. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And, that, and that's both because it's reputation and, let's say, there's a lot of money that meets up with alumni as well. Um, okay, so this is a pretty good list. How, much are the, how many of these dependencies do you think are essential to a university? That is, if you're not serving this, this thing you depend on, if that isn't something you're depending directly on, you're no longer a university. So, oh, students, okay. So students makes that list. Okay. If you don't have alumni funding, you don't have university. Maybe. Possibly. That may be difficult to sustain. Um, I, it, it is the case. It may, well, so there's also, we should distinguish there's for-profit universities, private universities. Uh, I believe some for-profit universities probably work without any alumni support uh, or much alumni support. Okay, accreditation. Uh, I'm going to stick that right here. And you, is that an essential? Yeah. Okay, so you're going to call that an essential dependency. Okay, everyone happy with this list of dependencies? So, let's see what, if this matches up. Okay, I think we hit a lot of these. Um, do you think they're all legitimate? In a sense, they all have a place within the university. <laughs> is there any one of these you think is a, a mistake? Universities should get rid of this dependency totally. Sports. Oh, oh, okay. You're you're a sports hater. Okay, I see. Harvard's Harvard uh, fundraising is going to mug you outside in a minute. But, uh, well, I think our sense is that there are some of these that are essential, and all of these are perhaps legitimate, but they need to be held in proper balance. The question is, uh, how do we make sense of certain essential things falling out of the framework, and what does that mean for our evaluation of university? And this is a philosophical point. Um, we had the J.L. Austin reading, which was unfortunately long and turgid, but uh, we want to make a stretch analogy here, which we think is actually useful to um, diagnosing institutional corruption. So Austin talks about performative utterances. He gives these examples of, I bet you this. You know, I do. I, just, I say, I do. What does that mean? That means I'm marrying somebody. Um, it's not a statement of simple fact. It's actually something I'm accomplishing by uttering this. Uh, I promise to. I point you. Uh, these are various things that have a place 
in our linguistic conventions that actually do something in the performance of speaking them. Um, but Austin points out that they only do this, they only function as this, as these uh, performance utters, performative utterances, uh, if you have the appropriate background conditions. That is, they depend on a lot of background conditions being the case. In fact, the act itself isn't even intelligible outside of many of these background conditions. Uh, it no longer makes sense to talk about that act. So it's not that I'm performing an act better or worse, but if some of these background conditions don't hold, you know, you can't even say I'm performing that act at all. So here's the little, you know, you might think of these examples, and I bet you $10. If I just say that to myself in a room, I haven't really bet anyone, have I? Um, if I t say I take you as my wife, but I'd say it to a horse. I mean, it could, be, it could be something else. You could be doing something else, like a comedy skit, but you're not doing what we normally think of as marriage. Um, I promise to travel back in time. If we think that's impossible, it doesn't make sense to call that a promise. Uh, I could say I appoint you king of France, uh, but clearly I can't. Um, so these are, Austin's making this, and the, the, these, you know, I think to us kind of very obvious and mundane points. He's doing it for his purposes against uh, a tradition of log logical positivism in the mid-20th century that's saying every statement we make can be evaluated by its truth value, whether or not it refers to something true or false in the world. And he's saying, no, no, language is much more complex than that. Um, but he has this insight that we can kind of make some passing that the intelligibility of certain linguistic conventions really depends on these background circumstances. Absent those circumstances, it doesn't even make sense um, to talk about the initial uh, concept in its, in its same form. Um, and we wondered if there's an analogy to be drawn uh, with practices or institutions more generally. So this is where it gets to be a little bit of a stretch, but let's see if this works. Uh, does anyone recognize what this is a photo of? Guesses. Not Pocahontas, close. Not actually, not, well, yes, kind of. Not, it's a long, in a roundabout way. <laughs> um, more yeses? Not the Salem Witch Trials, okay. You see the fires there? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fuzzy photo. I'll give you an idea, it's in the, uh, the South Pacific. Um, this is supposedly a photograph of, of what were called uh, an, an actual instance of a cargo cult. Uh, and the, the background on cargo, cargo cults is that in the Second World War, um, you had all these allied, uh, well, Japanese and then allied uh, bases set up in the South Pacific Ocean and all these islands. And you had a lot of natives there who, uh, you know, otherwise were what we consider, you know, completely divorced from a lot of Western technology. All of a sudden, you had these bases set up from nowhere. This is what the bases look like. And with the bases came medicine, food, alcohol, cigarettes, all sorts of great, fantastic wonders of uh, Western consumption. And the, the islanders are pretty happy with this. Uh, but the war ends, the planes go away. And um, on one telling of this, and, and this can be interpreted in a lot of more complex ways, but this is sort of naive telling of it. Um, the villagers there say, we want those planes back. Uh, we think we know how that happened. You build a runway, uh, you put lights down it, you have a, uh, uh, a little tower, and so you had the construction of these sort of fake runways that they thought, you know, or, and again, this is attributing to them maybe a, a level of naivety that it could be more complex, but the idea is they're, they're having an the appearance of this practice, uh, the appearance of something, but it's background conditions. They don't actually have, um, you know, some of the technology and uh, understanding that actually is constitutive of this larger institution. So you have something like the, uh, a fake or a um, chimeric, chimeric institution that doesn't actually function as one. Uh, it has all the trimmings of a little of an airport, um, but again, it's not actually constitutive one. The, the, a lot of background conditions aren't being met. So we think about universities and what, what's essential and what's window dressing. Can you, you know, the one question is, can you imagine a university uh, that sets up, um, and this is a debate right now about for-profit universities. I'm gonna set something up online. I'm gonna help people max out their student loans. I'm gonna give them classes uh, late at evening, and I'm gonna give them a degree that they can uh, get online. Uh, some have viewed this as an incredible technology that's enabling people who are, uh, have daytime jobs, who are non-conventional students to bone up on new skills and uh, information. Uh, others have pointed to a lot of uh, abuse 
of people who are probably paying a lot of money getting indebted uh, for degrees that aren't terribly valuable. Um, and a debate right now about whether sort of online universities are real universities. Are they, are they a, the appearance of universities put up to make profits off unsuspecting, unwitting, uh, naive students? Are they actually constituents of, of a real university? And what are some of the background conditions that hold to make a university genuine and real? Uh, so let's, let's think through this with a, a, a sort of additional thought experiment. Um, so you can imagine an institution, and we'll call this institution Carolina North. And Carolina North, uh, you show up in August uh, as a student. It's, a, it's a, uh, a thing that takes young people from around the, the country. You show up in August, you move into a dorm, uh, you begin, you, in the first week you assemble a schedule. Everybody's schedule basically consists of waking up in the morning, uh, going to work out, either cardio or weight rooms for a few hours. Uh, you eat lunch, there's, there's food available most all the day in the dorm. Uh, in the afternoons, you generally play football, practice football, watch football tapes. Uh, in the evenings, do more strategy uh, around football. On the weekends, you play football games, and every football game you play, you get $2,500 from a sports agent. Um, there's one more thing you do at the beginning of the year, which is you sign up for four classes. However, the classes never meet, and you get an automatic A in them. Um, and uh, so the question is, uh, what is Carolina North? Is it a college? Does it have the, does it have the background constitutive conditions to call it a college? I don't, I mean, you can imagine something like this called a football training camp, and I think it would be, that'd be totally intelligible as what a football training camp is. The question is, uh, does it strain credulity for us to call it, definitionally, a university or college? Is, it, is there some conditions there that aren't being met that make us say this concept no longer really applies? Okay, so here, here's the next question. Uh, what is the University of North Carolina? And uh, let's see if we can play this video here. Oh, let's see. I should mention. Football scandal has been a long and winding road with investigations of improper payments from sports agents and also academics on campus. And it all dates back to 2010 and a Twitter post from Carolina player Marvin Austin. He was tweeting about an expensive night at a nightclub in Miami Beach. By July of 2010, the NCAA launched an investigation of the UNC football program focused on impermissible benefits from sports agents. During the 2010-2011 football season, 14 players missed games because of investigations both at UNC and by the NCAA. And by September of 2010, associate head coach John Blake resigned because of questions about getting money from an agent in California. In July of 2011, UNC fired the head coach, Butch Davis. By March of 2012, the NCAA issued formal sanctions against the Carolina football program. And then in May of 2012, UNC released a faculty investigation revealing problems in more than 50 African American studies classes, classes popular with athletes. By August of 2012, the UNC Chancellor Holden Thorpe announced the university would study the athletic and academic programs on campus. At the same time, UNC appointed former Governor Jim Martin to investigate the African American studies class. And by December of 2012, Martin concluded there were 200 no-show classes and more than 500 unusual grade changes at UNC going back to 1994. And then in February of this year, Chancellor Holden Thorpe announced his resignation. He's now the provost at Washington University in St. Louis. <laughs> so that brings us to today and the criminal phase of this scandal. We should learn in the next few days the names of the five people now facing criminal charges in today's indictment. You can read more about the story Eyewitness News broke and read archive stories by going to our website, abc11.com. So, I love to hate UNC. I went to Duke and we're playing them tonight <laughs> in uh, basketball, so I should admit my bias in this example. Um, but if we're to diagnose this scandal um, and ask what went wrong, you might say that UNC, at least uh, some UNC departments, had become too dependent on athletics. That had become their primary dependency. 
Um, and they became independent of a number of other concerns, particularly concerns with, say, education. And if we think education is fundamentally constitutive of a university, uh, then you might say this dependency on athletics has corrupted uh, the actual institution of UNC, uh, that it's threatened the identity of a university, that somehow it's taken, away, taken us away uh, from what it ought to be doing. And, and the sort of operative word here has been dependence. Uh, and it's not to say that it's wrong for athletics to be a dependence in the university. It's wrong for it to be too much of a dependence because what can happen uh, if, we, if you want to take Austin's line and you don't need to, is that it's, it's literally become sort of unintelligible as the institution we initially thought it was. It no longer fits a lot of these background conditions. This one dependency has come out of whack. Um, so you might say this improper dependence has corrupted that university. Uh, and if they uh, beat Duke tonight, I'll think it's still corrupt. But uh, uh, so questions so far on the dependencies. Uh, this notion of dependence, uh, this is a kind of facile example, but um, we're going to be seeing over and over in our case studies uh, examples where <coughs> maybe the influence isn't wrong in and of itself if it's in within a number of other influences, but if it becomes too exclusive and we're going to have to make that distinction of whether this dependence has somehow corrupted the intelligibility of an institution uh, and its basic purposes. No question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, yeah, the sports agent. Yeah. I think, that, yeah, so that would be great, yes. So, this, so that's an example where, so the, to make sure that uh, everyone heard that, so there's part of the story was you have some sports agent in California uh, that's giving regular payments to a number of athletes, which is officially banned by uh, NCAA rules. So this is something that um, you might, it's, it's, it's illicit, um, and it's something that wasn't on our list here. Now, there might be side arguments for saying student athletes should be paid. I think those are actually pretty cogent arguments. Um, so perhaps it does belong on this list. But the, the, argu but the, the nature of that argument is precisely going to say, is there some sphere which we think is not, um, should not be influencing this institution, where we want to draw a wall of separation there. So this is, some, this is exactly what we're going to try to tease out in the, next, in, in the second half of the course today. OK. <clears throat> so moving on to the spheres of justice and this notion of spheres. Uh, uh, Walter isn't the originator of this phrase, but he does a lot with it in his political theory. And um, the, uh, he calls our attention to the nature of power at the beginning. Normally, when you hear this phrase, how is it completed? <laughs> yes, so this is Lord Acton's uh, famous dictum that Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Uh, so we should be suspicious if, we're, if we care about corruption of power, uh, if, we, if we take this uh, at face value. However, uh, Walter points out that lack of power can be devastating as well. Um, and he actually has this phrase by the end of his chapter, that lack of power can corrupt absolutely. So it's not a question of power, yes or no, uh, but a question of how to use power uh, for good without having it turn tyrannical. So this is, uh, you might say, the, the long-standing political question that Walter's exploring. And what he points out is that for most of human history, and this uh, resonates a bit with the uh, uh, natural state uh, concept that we explored a few, we a few classes ago, um, he says, through most of human history, the sphere of politics has been conducted on this absolutist model. And the idea is that you monopolize power if you're the ruler, and all your energies are to dominating that political society through all different spheres and realms. Um, that you have this sort of absolutist historical model in, 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 uh, in world politics. Um, but that in, in his own account of the development of modern government, one of the essential concepts of modern government and its legitimacy has been this understanding of limited government. That is government that's limited, that can't transgress certain spheres, uh, certain things. And it says, and eventually, it's this notion that there really are things that the state ought not be able to do. Etzioni, in his reading, begins uh, by sort of saying it's really important to think about political corruption. And in his little piece, he's looking at both what we might call explicit corruption uh, as well as institutional corruption. Uh, but he notes that defining corruption is very difficult in part because 
each definition is going to reflect political theories, distinct political theories. And uh, in your own diagnosis, particularly of political corruption, uh, you should be maybe have in mind or sometimes make explicit the kind of political theories and political vision uh, that's allowing you to come up with this diagnosis and definition. So what can't the state do on Walter's telling? What are some of the hallmarks of state limits, limits of government? That's a question. So no enslaving. You have, you have this personal right to your person that can't be expropriated by the state, can't be, uh, you can't be placed under uh, the rule of another in various personal matters that would constitute enslavement, okay? So no speech, this idea that people have rights of expression, rights of conscience, that, that this is in some sense inviolable. Um, and Walter will kind of hedge his, his bets on a lot of these things and say, you know, of course within reason or within limits, but a vibrant sense that there is an understanding of freedom of speech which the government, even if it has interests, um, you know, it just can't on its own basic interests say we're going to limit that. You can't interfere with marriages? So marriages, yes. This notion of family life as being a sphere which government doesn't get to come, come in your house, tell you how to raise your kids, uh, that sort of thing. So this notion that political power can't be for sale, that what it, however, however it be, it's constituted an exercise, you want um, a process which doesn't allow you to just have a friend, a family, a crony, or the highest bidder buying political favors. Uh, they can't discriminate against certain groups. This notion of discrimination. So there's, uh, there's boundaries of identity that we think shouldn't enter into considerations for, say, the distribution of public goods. So when you come for Social Security, they can't say, are you a Democrat or Republican, uh, before they decide what level to give you or something like that. Can't restrict religion. No restriction of religion, yes. So this notion, again, of, uh, of conscience and belief, there's a, there's a private sphere for that that is beyond the government's expertise to compel uh, and legitimate, legitimate, legitimacy to compel. I think we named many of them. No enslavement, can't arrange marriages, can't use justice systems to persecute political opponents. That's actually uh, a pretty important point. Uh, no special privileges, citizens equal, no discrimination, private property safe from arbitrary confiscation, government can't control citizens' religious life, no censorship of ideas. And if you think of these, and, and I, I, I don't, the actual uh, terminology here isn't terribly important, but you can conceive of these as different spheres. So you have a personal sphere, um, a family sphere, uh, you might say a, a, a legal or a rights sphere, um, uh, you know, economic sphere, which should be based on competition and not uh, your privilege. Um, you know, again, you know, legal, personal, personal, public, uh, you know, there's a public sphere, that there, there can't be a public discourse that the government can't have control over. Um, so the, the, the basic, the kind of you know, first order naive conception of this is there are, there are these general spheres we can think about and we, there we circumscribe boundaries around them and say government hands off uh, in these areas uh, absent extraordinarily compelling uh, uh, reasons that go to the, the, the nature and stability of the state itself. So there are spheres beyond where it is wrong for government to transgress, which is another way of saying that, that good government shouldn't be totalitarian. It shouldn't see everything. It shouldn't be in control of everything. Uh, Walter's claim that this is essential to our modern sense of legitimacy. That limited government is a crucial means to what he describes as a complex equality. And the history of the development of a lot of political institutions was actually working out where some of these boundaries belong. So this is the English Bill of Rights from 1689 uh, and one of the boundaries that Walter mentions is uh, sort of not up in this picture. So it says, whereas it hath beth been found by experience that it's inconsistent with the safety and welfare of this Protestant kingdom to be governed by a popish prince or by any king or queen marrying a papist, the said lord spiritual and temporal and commons do further pray that it may be enacted. So this is the law that all and every person and persons that is or are or shall be reconciled or sh shall hold communion with the see of church or Rome or shall profess the popish religion, shall marry a papist, shall be excluded forever. 
incapable to inherit, possess, or enjoy the crown and government of this realm to Ireland and dominions there into belonging to any part of the same, or to have use or exercise of any le regal power, authority, jurisdiction within the same. So it's saying if you're a Catholic, you can hold public office. Um, this is an essential part of the English Bill of Rights in 1689. Uh, and there's a rationale, right, that this is important for the safety and welfare of the Protestant kingdom. Um, so the sphere of religion here was not independent of the state. Um, but if you fast forward 100 years, you have the US Constitution, um, Article 6, Paragraph 3, where this separation is officially enacted. So it says, no religious test shall be ever, ever be required as a qualification for any office or public trust. Uh, so this sphere has been sort of cordoned off, that we think it's illegitimate to require religious belief um, as a criterion for public office. Um, What's interesting, so England still has uh, a variety, it was slightly amended, but they still have a, uh, a restriction of sorts on the monarch's uh, religion. Um, and again, they had a compelling reason because they thought it was important to the state security. They said uh, Protestant nations uh, are better governed by Protestants. Um, and they had uh, a, a number of bloody civil wars to suggest that was true. Now, this has big implications. Like this, uh, what Walsh was saying, at first glance, you might say, yeah, 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 we want distinctions, we don't want to be totalitarian, fine. But this has really big distinctions for when we're thinking about analyzing the purpose of an institution and what contributes to its efficacy um, and whether we want to call that a corruption or not. Um, we've talked about weakening the effectiveness of an institution as being a, a sign of corruption. Um, but exactly how we cash that out is going to depend on what we think are legitimate boundaries. Uh, so here's an example. You know, here's a, an institution in America, uh, the Office of Homeland Security. Uh, what's their purpose, the Office of Homeland Security? Okay. <laughs> That's actually not far from their actual official mission statement. Uh, so this is what their explicit purpose, uh, their statutory purpose, the purpose that they put on their website, to secure the nation from the many threats we face. Now, this is the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, uh, the rights of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, and papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now, I submit to you that the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution um, is corrupting the homeland securities, their effectiveness. Homeland Security could be much more effective. They could achieve their purpose better if the Fourth Amendment wasn't there. And the question is, sort of, you know, if we're, if we're looking at this very naively and you, you read our definition from the beginning of the course, you might say, aha, an institutional corruption, Homeland Security, uh, it's being corrupted by the Constitution. Therefore, you know, we need to remedy this. And Walzer's point, uh, if we accept it, is that in fact uh, there's a larger normative consideration here and that is the boundaries uh, around which these considerations can pass and cross. And so, you know, Walter is going to be on the side of the Fourth Amendment here and say, uh, you know, the purpose of Homeland Security needs to be, and, and its uh, execution needs to be done consistent with respecting these political, or these spheres, uh, the modern politics that said, you know, should be separate. And that they can't, uh, to actually have one of these spheres, spheres influence the other um, could itself be a corruption. So <clears throat> you'll notice that this mirrors other ethical debates many of you may have encountered in other courses in thinking about philosophy or politics. What's, what's the kind of obvious setup here between who and who? Give me some names or ideas. General concepts. So what, uh, so this, you might think of the homeland security debate here uh, between the effectiveness of an institution and its constraint by certain uh, other spheres or, or larger considerations um, as being a, a debate, a social debate we've had a lot in the history of moral philosophy um, about how we're to think about ethical, uh, our ethical evaluations of things. Yes, the death penalty. We can turn that into this debate. So, um, 
suppose one person says, if we have a death penalty, there will be lower crime. And another person says, um, uh, people have a natural right to life, which they can't forfeit either, you know, even through heinous crimes. Therefore, we ought never put someone to death. How would you describe these two positions? This is very basic, and I'm overcomplicating it. Yes. It could be empirically false. It's a claim. Yep. It's a claim. A uh, variety of that. So I think the first we might call various sorts of utilitarian considerations, which may or which exactly admit of empirical uh, inquiry. Um, and you can think of various deontologist rights-based approaches to ethics, where uh, the utilitarian, the consequentialists are going to say, at the end of the day, what's producing the most good? And uh, if it turns out that, you know, discriminating against this group of people ends up making society better off, maybe we should do that. And you can think of more uh, rights-based people who say, look, they're fundamental rights people have. You can never violate them, even if it would be conducive to all sorts of public outcomes that we kind of like. Um, we don't mean to totally rehash that uh, debate here. I can tell you, in some corners, people think this can be somewhat resolved through a kind of u rule utilitarianism. Does anyone, anyone familiar with that? Give us a quick definition of rule utilitarianism. Yeah. And even catching that one stage further, we could say there's certain there's some rules which aren't always going to give us the right answer to every case. But if in general they're followed, they are which that which produces the greatest overall social outcomes are good. So, uh, a mundane example, you might think of traffic lights. So traffic lights, I don't know if anyone's ever come to a traffic light at midnight and there's no one on the road, and the question is, should you actually stop? How many people stop at a traffic light at midnight when there's no one else on the road? Why, you all? You're wasting utility. You could be, I mean, you're, you're, you're hampering yourself. You, you're gonna, you could be there that much quicker if you didn't stop. You're smart people. You know what an empty road looks like. You could speed right through it. Um, supposing there aren't cameras there that can give you tickets. Um, that one might be a, a very you know, cruel act-based, or you know, very uh, specific act-based utilitarianism might say, look, you every time make an individual judgment about whether this is better off for the world or not. And in this case, it would be better off for the world if you just go straight forward. Ah, OK. Anyone missing a little purse ID? Uh, maybe if you can put it right on the uh, desk out there, we'll check it on the way out. Thank you. Excellent. That was a uh, for utilitarian calculus. That was probably a good idea. Um, so, so one thought is that. Um, People should make their own judgments. They, you might get more global utility out of that. The reservation, though, is uh, as a general rule, it's probably better for everyone to stop because people are going to make the wrong judgments a lot when they're on their own. And that's going to lead to some pretty horrific accidents if somebody is going straight through a red light. And because of the, this fallibility, because of um, the way this catches out in practice, actually the best rule for the world is for everybody to stop at red lights all the time. Um, and when we think about it, some of the rules that are constraining institutions as we go forward, um, there will be cases where a specific rule issues in a bad outcome. And we need to step back and think, well, is that rule of such general use overall that we want to keep it in place? Or do we need more uh, specific determinations on a case-by-case -case basis? Um, and my, my simple point in kind of having this little detour is that you can think of Walter's spheres in either, in either set of terms. You can think of them as deontological, as rule utilitarianism. But in either case, his point is that there, uh, we evidently have in all sorts of uh, common, every, uh, common everyday understandings a sense of spheres that shouldn't be transgressed. And this is another way in which we might conceptualize institutional corruption is if there's a sphere that's trying to influence another sphere where we think there should be a strong moral boundary between them. Um, uh, and sometimes it's going to be really easy. Sometimes we're going to have to make much stronger arguments about where to draw these boundaries, and that's going to be a difficult uh, problem. So let's think through some test cases on this as well. Um, we'll start with the more absurd. Suppose there's a study that comes out. So we're going to have to admit this as an empirical possibility. Suppose there's a study that comes out that says people with red hair 
uh, are disruptive in educational environments. Uh, they, they generally perform less well on uh, exams overall. Uh, their bright red hair distracts other students. Uh, they have uh, personalities that are too uh, high maintenance and, and vocal. And therefore, university admissions committees um, say either we're not going to take red haired applicants or we're going to discount them significantly in the applicant pool. Because we care about the effectiveness of a university, we want to have student, a situation in which students can learn, uh, which people aren't distracted, and we want our students to perform better, and redheads seem to take away from all these things. By show of hands, who thinks this is an appropriate? Okay, one, two, and he's actually, you're kind of redheaded too, okay. That's an honest man, okay. Uh, so we can get two on the more extreme examples. Um, let me push this case a little further. Suppose, well, we know, so many people in America are affected by mental health things. Uh, it's one of the major investments universities make uh, for all sorts of good reasons uh, in mental health facilities uh, for students. Um, and oftentimes it can be a, a reason for students to have to take time off. Um, you might think of a university that obviously they're going to spend a lot of resources thinking about how do we support students uh, and how do we see people with various sorts of uh, you know, mental health issues uh, through completion of the degrees. But maybe we want to accept fewer people with mental health problems. Maybe that you think this would be more conducive to university. Um, maybe in an application uh, we might ask people about their mental health history. Uh, would this be permissible? Let's ask it in the reverse way. Uh, who thinks this shouldn't be permissible? Should not. Okay. I'm getting a, okay, that's good. I see a few people left their hands down. Um, let me move back to the outrageous stage a little bit more. What if we asked if your parents had a mental health history? Because it turns out that can, there are high correlations between family histories, um, not perfect correlations. Is this also inadmissible? Yeah, okay. What about having been to prison? If a university says, uh, if you're a convicted felon, we are probably going to discount your application heavily, and we probably don't want you on campus. How many people think this is appropriate? Aha. Okay, uh, why is this different than the other two cases? Maybe more different is that um, some of the students have maybe tried to have more control over that group where they might have gone to the same thing. Mm -hmm. I can tell you though that mental health conditions and imprisonment are highly correlated. Mm -hmm. So you, you might in effect be doing the previous thing one step removed. But your point, I think, is, is, is also a very good moral intuition here, that there's a responsibility that this entails um, that the other two didn't. So I saw two hands very quickly. Uh, yeah. So I just really think it depends on the nature of the felony. Okay. Like there's certain ones that really shouldn't rule people out, but like sometimes people are drawn to like commit extreme acts. So, yeah. So nonviolent felons, if it's one of these white collar things or you know, petty drug crimes, that sort of thing, you might let them through. If they're a serial killer, draw the line there. <laughs> okay, that sounds eminently reasonable. If they're a serial killer, they're probably not going to be out of prison for a while anyway. So like, the question is really, like, what is the penalty? Yeah, so this would be an argument, look, uh, we have a judicial system that people pay their penalties, and after they've paid that, why should we continue to restrict them? You know, this is, isn't that an injustice? What if we find out this statistic is true? That we have a repeat crime rate which is very high and even when you're out of prison you often go back. This is a vicious cycle. 
Mm -hmm. So this could be a self-fulfilling prophecy that we think they're bad, so therefore we're going to make their lives very difficult. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. Number one, isn't it the case that like one in ten people have, spent, have spent some time in prison in America or something like that? Um, so I'm due for some, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perhaps, yeah, both good points. Uh, what, I, what I hope this is, is triggering is uh, there's a lot of other things that we can think about that predict performance that you might use for all sorts of utilitarian calculuses of how to make a good university class. Um, and we obviously do discriminate in all sorts of transparent ways. And we say you need high SAT scores, you need good transcripts, um, we think these are totally appropriate spheres to draw from in making all sorts of university admissions decisions. Um, there are other things which might be linked to performance and outcomes, but we say, look, that sphere is off limits. Uh, either for reasons of moral culpability, that's not the people's fault, or for other various reasons, we might say, um, even if there were things that were their fault, there, there are reasons why that should no longer govern and affect um, the criterion for admission to this uh, sort of institution. Um, there are going to be a lot of tough cases. Or there, there, you can imagine many or tougher cases of where you draw the line and where you're going to draw these spheres and boundaries. And uh, the simple point we want to make is not only that conceptually you can think of spheres of influence as one diagnostic tool, but you're going to have to argue where those boundaries belong uh, in thinking about institutional integrity and institutional corruption. Uh, some of you may know this, is, this continues to be uh, policy. What, one of the ways in which HIV was spread very early on uh, was through a few blood bank donations before we had reliable blood tests for it. Um, and so starting, I think it was in the early 80s, they made a blanket prohibition for uh, any gay men donating blood, and this continues to this day. Uh, and the public health rationale is very transparently obvious for this, that you're going to decrease statistically, um, you know, various sorts of contaminations. Uh, uh, in blood banks doing, having this law in place. On the other hand, you have various gay rights groups that say, um, look, I can be tested, I can uh, you know, show my clean bill of health, I want to contribute to this public institution, this public good, uh, why am I being discriminated with, why don't I belong in this, um, in, in this uh, have access to this institution? Um, let me just do a quick test of intuitions here. How many people think this is actually a reasonable law that statistically the public health considerations are pretty compelling here. Um, so it makes sense to exclude people, although we would say sexual orientation is not a legitimate exclusion for a lot of other things, certainly for university admission. This is a case where it might actually be really important for public health benefits. Therefore, uh, it's, it's right to have this uh, sphere kind of cordoned off. Okay, two, two, yeah, so voting for, this is a good idea. Oh, sorry, sorry. So this, this is the public health people saying, this law makes sense, uh, okay. Okay. There are arguments for it that, uh, that do make sense. Uh, this is a, a very interesting situation that's presented over here. Um, I know that nurses that I'm aware of have a, have a problem with accepting donations from private institutions. Um, that being said, be, because, because the incubation period for what they can test for is outside of Okay, so these are some of the arguments that would need to be had. I'm gathering, so how many people think this law should be undone or overturned? So that seems to be the majority holding the case. And we're, uh, so I think there's, there's some disagreement here, uh, but you know, you've highlighted some of the arguments uh, that would need to be made on either side of thinking what are, what are permissible considerations 
um, uh, of whether or not this is a corrupting thing. So in the background, there's going to be the social and moral calculus uh, of how to, where do we think these appropriate boundaries uh, should be drawn, um, something that we're going to be keeping in mind. Uh, sometimes these rules are going to lead to outcomes that are kind of bad. So either way that case is decided, you're either going to be um, you know, making a community, a minority community, uh, you know, feel like second class citizens, which is its own sort of bad, or you might allow uh, the transmission of a disease uh, because of uh, neglect or error or, uh, you know, various sorts of uh, uh, the inability of tests to detect something early on. And one of the questions is, for the overall effectiveness institutions, what's the right mix? Um, let me give you a very quick, very quick example from corporate law. So co corporate law, this comes up all the time. We create various sorts of corporate vehicles, and then people do things with them that we might think are kind of fishy, but the question is, can we actually crack down on them without destroying the structure and purpose of corporate law in general, which is to have an open access um, legal entity form that you can do exactly what the legal entity says. So imagine there's a company in California. Uh, they're getting involved in uh, very heavy construction shipping. So they have these 10-ton trucks that are out in the highways. They have a whole fleet of them. And uh, the company does well. It's making money. But they realize one day that if one of these 10-ton truck, 10 trucks ever ran into a school bus or ever ran into a, a, a traffic jam, it would just kill a lot of people, cause a lot of harm. And this is a, an unfortunate reality. It's, a, it's, it's an accident that might happen. And uh, the amount of harm is pretty great. So the kind of lawsuits that could be brought could be $40, $50 million lawsuits, uh, whereas they can only get insurance uh, for about a million dollars. So they're this California corporation operating a legitimate business, trying to be as safe as they can, but realizing they'll be totally wiped out if they ever had an accident and uh, a set of lawsuits against them. So what they do is they set up in Nevada a second corporation. And what that corporation does is then buys, well, it buys, it, they transfer all the assets from the California corporation to the Nevada corporation. So it's a different corporation. And the corporation in California, then each month they lease those supplies from the Nevada corporation. So on paper then, the California corporation um, is basically an office, an office involved with various shipping activities that then goes, turns around and leases these vehicles. And if it turns out if they ever get in a big accident, uh, they have no assets. Their assets are just their last week or the last month's um, income before they paid the leasing services. Uh, so uh, school buses run over and the parents all want to sue the company, but it turns out the company has no money. Um, should we allow this? Is this, a, is this a corruption of corporate law? How many people think this is actually okay? That Corporations, this is, this is totally legal within corporate law. Uh, anyone okay with it? Yes, great. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think part of the reason I was justified is I think in our culture it's such like a um, do happy culture that it actually like, won't recycle those or those like corrupt activities. So um, if your company was you know, fearful that it could go out of business because of those, because of those suits, um, it might not even take up the action to doing it. You actually could sort of This would be a, a macroeconomic view that says, look, these corporate forms, uh, they can be used to shield liability, but overall for the economy, it's going to be really rare to get an accident, and you don't want to hold up you know, the ability of most companies to function because of this one crazy small eventuality. So this might be a good overall economic thing. Yes? Mm -hmm. So you lose all of, like, incentive to, like, perform good business. 
So you want these incentives balanced, and we recognize there, 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 there can be pretty bad incentives in either direction here. Uh, one can be an incentive not to care about safety. Um, the other can be incentive against economic investment uh, and business growth. Um, how typical do you think these cases are in corporate law? Very. Yes. So almost every institution is going to have a set of rules which, if they were modified one way, would benefit a certain group of people. If they were modified another way, are going to benefit another group. Um, so lots at stake in actually trying to draw these uh, rules in a way that we think it, it makes sense in the overall evaluation. Um, and that's not going to be easy. Now let me just say something very briefly about Etzioni um, in trying to pull some of these things together. Uh, he has this debate, uh, where, he, where he kind of opens up this debate in his beginning of this piece. And this piece is in many ways a sort of overview of the state of corruption literature in the United States and asking, what does it make sense to take a lot of these disparate understandings of corruption, pull them together, and have a real research agenda around them? Um, and one thing he mentions in the outset is there's some people that want to say in a kind of, um, in maybe you, invoking Walter, that it's illegitimate ever to provide words to special interests. And there's another group that's going to say, look, you're fooling yourself if you think politics can ever be anything but that. Um, that it, it's very difficult to conceive of any political activities, any laws that aren't going to benefit some or others. Therefore, um, we're, we're just naive just to, to think the first option is actually a real option. Uh, uh, Etzioni goes on to make a, another point, which I think, regardless of how that earlier debate is settled, is a fundamentally right point, and that is that any functional polity has to operate under some shared understanding about the common good. And it's going to be this sort of understanding that we're going to be appealing to when we try to um, adjudicate a lot of these cases and say what are the right kind of overall socially good rules um, that can produce the outcomes we want. Uh, and Etzioni gives a list uh, in the meat of that paper throughout the middle part where he goes beyond quid pro quo corruption and catalogs all these other sorts of things that look like they violate our conceptions of the common good. Um, and for each of those, uh, what are some of the examples of those? Let's just very, at a very general level, what are some of the things that makes that list? Etzioni's list, uh, he goes sort of every few paragraphs, he has a new title. Um, So various sorts of, uh, he'll describe as capture, uh, regulatory capture, uh, the ways in which private interests influence regulatory bodies. Um, what else? What else makes his list? There was an example about gun laws. Yep. I can't remember all the specifics, but basically the, and the NRA lobbying, lobbying to gun laws, basically. Yeah, he thought the, the restrictions on the ATF had been somewhat absurd, uh, and they're kind of required the hoops they need to jump through, and this has been because of a, a big lobbying group. Um, but he goes through and he, he just enumerates uh, time after time things that strike, they offend his conception of the common good, of what a good polity should and do and look like, and ask a little bit about what are the political conditions that led up to that. Um, we're going to be doing the same thing for the institutions we look at. Uh, and we're going to, just to give you a preview, um, you might come to an institution like a pharmaceutical company where we can all say the institution of health is very important. Um, we want the provision of medical services, devices, of new pharmaceutical drugs that enable people uh, to be healthy um, and to heal. And the next level down, we're going to have questions about, well, what counts as, what are some of the institutions in which pharmaceutical companies are embedded and what counts uh, as a functional way of those institutions um, actually operating? So looking back to the first part of today's lecture, we think about dependence corruption and the intelligibility of institution. We'll see there are a lot of pharmaceutical companies that um, got wise to the nature of drug testing, and so they set up their own drug testing firms, and then they would also set up their own um, research groups who would go and ghostwrite articles and send them out to their own publishing companies, which would then review the articles, um, and then oftentimes get an independent academic to put his name on the top and say it was his article. And there's a certain point where you might say, does this 
we have, this, we have these background institutions, the notion of peer review, of objective clinical trials, and the question is, has that, have we gotten to a point where that's no longer even an intelligible process if a drug company is controlling every aspect of that, and a lot of it looks like a sham. A lot of it might look like a cargo cult where you have the appearance, but you don't have the constitutive entities, the constitutive uh, processes going on. Um, we're also gonna have questions about where the spheres and boundaries should be drawn around pharmaceutical companies. Uh, what can we test on human beings, and at what stage can we do that? <coughs> Uh, what is it right for people to voluntarily submit to uh, at different stages of drug trials, and how do we protect those? Should we allow people in the third world to engage in trials uh, for much lower rates than people in the first world will? Uh, what sort of benefits and information do we need to give them um, uh, versus what things can we keep hidden from them about the nature of the trial, of its random assignment? Uh, these questions are all gonna be parasitic on our understanding of the common good about these ultimate questions of legitimacy. Um, so we shouldn't lose sight of that. Think about this as the anchor uh, for a lot of your diagnostic uh, frameworks and tools as we go forward. Um, and uh, as you write your paper, I think we've laid out in the first third of this course a lot of political considerations. But going forward, uh, we're going to keep these conceptions of the common good in, in the background. But our focus is going to be on you know, more of the engineering aspect of what went wrong in this institution, what's your diagnosis, and how do you make it better. Uh, so that's all we have for today. Questions about the second, about either the spheres or about our general plan going forward. I see a smile on the Leoster's face. What's this? No. No questions. Okay. Yes. Oh yeah. So, so these, aren't, these aren't meant to be exclusive concepts. Um, but so if we think about a dependence, so we think it's important that universities be dependent on students in some respect. Um, and then in fact, excluding that dependence to the exclusive focus on another dependence um, is gonna corrupt it. But what we're not saying is that it's wrong for the sphere of sports to influence academic institutions. So our, our judgment there isn't a, as you might call it, a sphere violation. Um, these, are, these can be totally, depend, totally appropriate, uh, but it's a matter of balance. So um, here, here I think the, that analytic framework is more useful, where our claim is not that it's wrong to think about athletics. The claim is that it's wrong to be too dependent on it to the exclusion of other things. Uh, whereas in some of these uh, you know, discrimination cases, um, we're going to say, look, it's just wrong to consider that period. That shouldn't be part of the equation. Um, it's wrong to be able to go into anyone's house in the middle of the night if you're a police and do whatever you want. Uh, we understand that would be better for the effectiveness of the institution. You'll get more convictions, you'll catch more terrorists, um, but there's a boundary there where that sphere can't be transgressed. Uh, so that's less a question of, I mean, you, you could cash it out perhaps and, and f phrase it maybe in terms of dependence, but I think conceptually, so what distinguishes it from this is an idea that there's just something off limits totally. Um, so those, those I think, two, you know, two helpful analytic sort of frameworks to be thinking with. Mm -hmm. And that was, yes, exactly. So the question about the Californian um, sports agent. So, you, you know, once you become more dependent on sports, then you might open up to a sphere of influence that no longer that that we really think is illegitimate, um, but it's uh, it's what you know a great example of the way in which these two things might work together. So it's a kind of two-stage judgment there. We we began by being too dependent on this, um, then we opened up this uh, influence from a sphere that should have been cordoned off. Uh, Yeah, yeah, so I think yeah, two, two important distinctions there. One is um, if we take, so relate spheres maybe to the first, uh, some of Austin's points. Um, 
it would be totally fine to have a group of people that get together to have a university that's majority of athletes um, and who want to make you know most of their activities relating to athletic stuff. You can imagine a, a athlete school or something like that. Um, but the question, I think, at the end of the day is what, it, what is the institution that you're aspiring to be? If at a certain point you get rid of all classes, it's probably hard to call you a university. Um, and and it, you know, how you arrange various universities that do have classes along with sports, you know, totally plausible you could have one in which, um, I mean, we have a variety of universities out there, right? We have universities that focus on the arts, universities that focus on the sports, universities that are known for their great books programs. Um, clearly, the enormous diversity allowed there uh, that's still within this conceptual, it makes intelligible to talk about them as universities. But if we think, you know, the, the, the process of education is somehow constituent of university, then if that totally gets jettisoned, um, you know, it's hard to even think about it as, as the right term. Uh, but something also related to what you said is you, you might think of, um, this comes up with religious discrimination cases all the, ca all the time, you have some very small minority religion that thinks child sacrifice is part of its religious uh, uh, convictions and part of its religious practice. And we say as a society, whoa, 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 we have a sphere about, around religion, but that sphere doesn't allow you to get over other moral constraints we believe are important in society. So um, in some ways, you know, there's always going to be a normative appraisal at the top of this all where we say, you know, what's our conception of the common good and how does that cash out? Oftentimes, what we seem to have determined in our modern politics is that generally, for the most part, religious belief is off limits. But that religious belief itself needs to be circumscribed so that it's not uh, horrendously violating various other moral norms that we think are, are important. Yeah, so, so if we, we had the, uh, Lessig had that case of the, the bridge uh, that was built in such a way to discriminate um, in practice, although not explicitly, that you couldn't have minority populations taking a bus out to the beach. And we should think of architecture as, I think, one of the many engineering questions in uh, how, we, how we can design and influence institutions, um, along with law norms and et cetera. And you might, I mean, you might think of architecture, architectures that are created because of improper dependencies, architectures that um, uh, also transgress on s particular spheres. So something that, I mean, you can think about um, uh, the, some of the handicap discrimination law that we have. And the idea is that it's, it's actually inappropriate now to build a new building in which nobody with a wheelchair has access. And uh, you know, this, we've made this very specific moral determination that although architecture might be convenient for a lot of, you know, you might say the purpose of many institutions would be nice to just build steps, but they're saying, look, there's this consideration which is you're excluding people from a whole, you know, if you think of uh, various sorts of people with disabilities as constituting their own interest and sphere, you're excluding them from, you know, various access to important goods and services. Uh, so we're going to say, uh, separating those two spheres, or you know, separating people is illegitimate, and therefore one of our architectural requirements is going to be one that provides access. Uh, and architecture, as Lessig uses it, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty broad, encompassing notion. It can be anything from the physical laws of the universe, which we can't change, to you know, very specific uh, institutions that, you know, uh, steps and physical access. And we, uh, his point is that we we oftentimes just don't even think about that. Uh, we often think about, you know, what's the law say? What are the penalties? Can you be thrown into jail for that? What are the rewards? And his point is that we often are much more subtle um, and long-lasting in the way we influence people's behavior by doing what he's calling, I think, both literally as well as a larger metaphor as architecture. Um, and that's something we're thinking about, uh, both, as, both in diagnosing maybe why things aren't the way we'd like them to be, as well as thinking about design options going forward. I hope so.
discriminate based on something, yes. But not on sexual orientation, not on homosexuality, it's based on promiscuity. Mm -hmm. The problem of the invasion theory. Mm -hmm. So, so this is an example of maybe an engineering um, innovation where we might say, look, if you're concerned with using an official designation as a way of excluding, here's another thing that gets at more profoundly the question you're interested in. Um, so it might make more people interested. There's also going to be, though, perhaps these, you can think of metaphorically architectural concerns of, is what you're doing when you have, say, you know, we're not going to say um, minorities can't vote. We're just going to have a reading, a reading test at the beginning. Because uh, we just care about literacy. Um, and the question is, you know, what is architecturally, what is that doing? What are its implications? In, the day, in, the, in today's day of big data, we, have, we know a lot about correlations. And we can phrase things sometimes in ways that have very explicit effects without identifying those groups. So those gonna, these are going to be great questions. We're going to encounter them uh, repeatedly in a lot of our cases. Where do we draw the lines? What's the best way to architect this? What's the best way to distinguish these sorts of things so that we have the right balance of influence at the end of the day? Um, and not ones that we think are profoundly illegitimate or immoral or corrupting of institutions. So. Great. Thank you. See you on Tuesday and look early next week for a, a survey that will be supremely interesting and helpful for thinking about psychological biases. Okay. Ah,